Um, so I don't know if you guys have been around this year, but 2020 has been something, hasn't it? Um, so we've, we've got a, a global pandemic. We had murder hornets. Um, we've had the, the worldwide economy just kind of shut down. Uh, quite a few people out of work. We've had several instances of injustice, and then those have sparked protests and riots and a national and worldwide conversation about race and the role it plays in our lives. And to be honest, it's hard not to feel overwhelmed by it all. Um, in fact, according to a survey done, done by John Hopkins, uh, the number of Americans suffering from depression and anxiety has tripled this year, um, with the largest increase among young adults aged 18 to 24. Uh, the percentages are roughly like, usually it's about 3% and it's jumped up to 13% of individuals this year. That survey was done in April. So at the start of the pandemic, uh, before all of the other stuff happened. So. I'm, I'm pretty confident that within the last four months, the numbers have shifted a little bit. Um, and, and I'm, and I'm going to have to be honest. If I was given that survey at various different points within the last four months, it's been tough. It has been tough. You know, I, I'm sure I would have answered that I was anxious, that I was depressed. However, as Christians, we have hope, we have promises, we have assurances, we have blessings. And they're given to us by a God that we can trust. And so today we're going to look at some of those promises. We're going we're gonna to be in Romans 8. Um, Romans is a really, really dense book. So um, as I kind of intro this, Feel free to turn in your Bibles, your devices to Romans 8. We are going to start verse 1. Um, and a lot of ink has been spilled over the last 2,000 years of Christendom about just the book of Romans. Um, explicating it, exegeting it, trying to figure out what Paul was saying, the arguments he was making. It's long, it's dense, the arguments are complex. Um, in fact, the 17th century theologian John Owen wrote an entire book just on Romans 8 alone. So we're going to look at Romans 8. I'm not going to do a John Owen, all right? I'm not going to give you a book. I'm just going to be highlighting a few points, going to be scratching the surface. Um, this won't be a deep dive. Um, we're not going to take, you know, eight weeks on Romans 8 or anything like this. This is going to be a really, really um, surface level. Um, book, and uh, we're going to look at three points that I want to make. Um, and so the first, the first point that I want to make is uh, Paul points out that that we're free. All right. Um, in the in the preceding section of the letter, Paul just got done talking about the struggle between his mind and his flesh. If you go back to Romans seven and read that. Um, it's this, it is this like epic battle between Paul's mind and his, his flesh. Um, and, and he puts it into multiple different terms and he goes back and forth and back and forth. And um, he says he wants to do good, but he keeps on doing evil. He says he doesn't understand what he does and that he does what he hates. And he ends the section by saying, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So this is where this is where chapter eight picks up. And so like the chapter divisions are kind of arbitrary. Paul didn't send out the letter with chapters and divisions. And, um, so someone at some point put in these chapter and verse divisions. Um, but there are definite thoughts 
that are going on. So Paul shifts into chapter 8 on the heels of this mind-flesh idea. And he starts out and he says, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful, uh, of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So as we, as we look at this short snip, this beginning of chapter 8 of Romans, he says, therefore, so we kind of have to look back and see what what point is Paul making based on what he already said. Um, so Paul contrasts his desire what to do uh, to do good in his mind with what his flesh does, and he also has this like not only is there this mind flesh idea, but he talks about he compares the the flesh to um, the flesh and the mind to two two laws, and so he talks about the law of his mind which is his desire to do good. And he talks about the law of sin, which is what his flesh does that his mind doesn't want to do. And so here in, in Romans 8, 1 um, and, and following, we see that Paul takes this metaphor and he, he builds on it. And this is what Paul does all throughout Romans. He's got this kernel of idea, of, of idea and he just uses it all throughout his letter. And he does this in all of his letters. We went through Ephesians in our... In our um, small group last last year in the fall and the ideas that Paul puts forth in the beginning you can see him all throughout that letter building on that and basing his arguments later on on the on the first ones and so Paul does the same thing in Romans and so he's got he's got the mind and the flesh and he's got the law of sin and the uh, and, sorry the law of Sorry, I lost my place. Um, the law of sin, which is the flesh, and then um, there is the law of his mind. I'm sorry. Um, and so we know that um, even though the law of sin dwells in his flesh, those who are in Christ Jesus cannot be condemned by the law of sin because Christ fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law in human flesh. And so Paul continues in verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the, thing of the, the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind of, on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So not only are we free, right? God, through Christ, has set us free from the law of sin and death. We have life and we have peace. Right? That comes with freedom. We don't have to live under a weight of guilt, hiding in shame, as if God's going to punish us at any, at any moment. He's not going to reach down and, and spank us like a real mean dad. We have peace with God. We are no longer, the, the Bible calls it en, enmity with God. We are no longer at en, enmity with God. We have peace with God. We are no longer his enemies. Um, and with that peace comes the next benefit that we're going to talk about. And so that second one is that we are adopted. So we're going to move forward to verse 12. And it says... So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You'll see that, again, Paul's taking an argument that he made earlier, and he's, he's expounding upon it. Um, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. 
For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So what's interesting about this section here is that Paul's taking an argument that's even further back in the, in the, the book of Romans in chapter 6. And if you go back to chapter 6, I would encourage you to do that this week. Um, 6, 7, and 8 are just this phenomenal life of the Christian idea. Um, but in 6, Paul um, talks about this idea of union with Christ. Um, and, and you'll see this all throughout Paul's writing of union with Christ, being in Christ. Um, these are all concepts that Paul uses um, where we would use the term Christian. Paul uses the term in Christ or those who have union with Christ. Um, and in chapter 6, Paul relates our union with Christ um, to uh, our union with Christ in both his death and resurrection to new life. And so now we see in 8 where, where Paul's using this idea and he's associating it with adoption, right? So because we're united to Christ and because Christ is is the Son of God, we become children of God. Okay? God sees us as he sees Christ. So we become children of God because we're in Christ. But since we aren't by nature children of God, in, in um, I think it's in Ephesians, uh, Paul calls us children of wrath. Right? And then we become children of God. We're not by nature children of God. Um, only Christ is by nature a child of the Son of God. So we're united to Him. All right? But we're treated as children of God, and we can call the Father our own Father. It says here, we can cry, Abba, Father. And so not only that, but the Spirit testifies that we are children of God, and we also become co-heirs with Christ. And so because it's not a natural relationship, right, it's not as though we are begotten of the Father like the Son is begotten of the Father. It is more akin to an adoption relationship. Right? God treats us as his own children. We get the benefits just as his Son gets the benefits as well. And so we become co-heirs with Christ, um, and we get an inheritance. And that inheritance includes many be benefits, which we're covering some of them today. Um, but you're going to find others all throughout Scripture. Um, in this chapter alone, you're going to find um, that we're not going to cover today, but you'll find that we're made righteous. We are conformed to the image of Christ, which is called sanctification when we're made when we're made righteous that's called justification being conformed to the image of god is sanctification and then also being raised to new life to reign with christ and that's called glorification um, you'll find this further on in in romans some people call this the golden chain of redemption um, where we move through this process all the way to our glorification on the last day um, and that's all based on our union with Christ. It has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with Christ and what he's done. And because we are children of God, we have direct access to the Father through the Son by the Spirit. And that leads us to our final benefit um, from Romans 8, and that's that we have an intercessor. So we're going to move to we're going to move ahead uh, to verse 26. And Paul writes, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we uh, pray for as we ought. Excuse me. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings 
too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. It's one of my favorite verses. Um, and it's, it's intimately linked with the intercession that the Spirit does for us. So we, we see the Spirit interceding for us. And over the last few months, I, I kind of talked about this in the introduction, that this one has really resonated with me over these last few months. And I'm sure September will probably agree and agree heartily. Um, there have been several times where I don't even know or have the words to express what I'm feeling. Um, where I just feel like I can't even form the words or come up with the words to describe these complex emotions that have come upon me because of the weird stuff that's going on in our weird world. Um, I don't know if it's that I don't have the vocabulary or if English doesn't even have these words. But it's been tough. And I, there's been times where I've audibly just groaned. Because I don't even know what to say, guys. And we read here that in those times... That even though my wife or my kids or my parents or my fellow elders or any of you who are around me, even if you can't understand me, the Spirit can. And that's such a comfort. Because even when I don't know what I even mean, <laughs> The Spirit, the Spirit knows. And it's not even just that. There's stuff going on around us that we have no solution for. None. We don't have a vaccine. We don't know when we're going to get a vaccine or if one will ever come. Guys, I'm going to be honest, I feel hopeless sometimes. But I have hope because of Jesus. And I can go to God and just lay whatever I have out. And the Spirit intercedes for me and goes to God for me. And it's not just like the Spirit's going to take what I'm feeling and just be like, God, here's this kind of broken prayer. Here's this, I don't know, but here you go. It, it says here that the Spirit intercedes according to the will of God, which is insane. God is so much bigger than me, and His plans are so much mightier than me. And when I go to, to God, with my silly ideas in comparison to, to God's massive plan. The Spirit intercedes according to the massive plan of God. And if that wasn't good enough, Paul assures us of one more thing, and that's that the Spirit's going to intercede for us He's going to conform our prayers to the will of God. And I know that what the Spirit takes to God, to God is going to be for my good. I don't even know if my plans are for my good. I, I, I mean, I could come up with the greatest plan to solve this pandemic or the these riots or whatever's swirling around us, and it could fall flat on its face. But I know 
God's plans are better than my own and they're for my good. It means that if I mess up a prayer, um, that the Spirit's going to bring it to God. It's going to be according to His will. And it's going to work out for my good whether I prayed it right or not. And that has been a huge comfort these last few months. Um, knowing that all of the brain power and computing power and all the things that we can come up with pale in comparison to the plans of God. Um, and that God has my good in mind with his plan because I know I'm called according to his purpose and that I love him that my mind is set on the spirit and so I encourage you guys this week to go to Romans 8 uh, read 6, 7, and 8 um, they're great chapters they are full of assurances Paul really just lays everything out. Um, he's, he's, it, seven is a great chapter if you're struggling with, with sin in your life uh, because you can see Paul, Paul the Apostle who wrote the Spirit-breathed words of Scripture um, wrestled. Um, but then he turned it right around and he gave us these assurances. He let us know that we're free. He let us know that we're adopted. And that we have an intercessor. And the only way that we have all these things is, is again, through union with Christ. And, and we know how union with Christ comes through faith. It doesn't come through anything that I do. It doesn't come through works. Romans 4, 5 is clear. It comes through faith. Trusting that Christ is the Messiah, that he was raised from the dead, that he conquered sin and death for our salvation. Um, if you haven't put your faith in Christ, I would encourage you, find me, find Glenn, talk to somebody about it. Um, because the peace that I feel in these times I know it sounds contrite, but it's a peace that passes all understanding. And it's not a perfect peace by any means. But it's a peace that God's given me, and it's a benefit of that union with Christ. So let's pray. God, thank you for the words. Of, of Paul, God, your words through him that your spirit gave to him. God, we thank you for the, the assurances you give us in your scriptures. We thank you for the benefits that we gain through union with Christ. God, through, through your son, perfectly earning those for us. God, that we are united and that we are co-heirs, that we are adopted. God, thank you for even taking this prayer, for sending your spirit, interceding on behalf of this prayer. God, that we have the spirit to do that for us, that we don't have to rely on a broken human to intercede for us. God, we thank you. We ask that you be with us, be with Eric and his family as they travel home, um, and be with us as we go. Keep us safe. May your face shine upon us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.